Father, we thank you. The sweet taste, that's what, it's poisonous, right? You don't want your dog to lick it. Right, they're always saying, don't lick your auntie's feet. this time, and just be able to open your word and study from it. Father, we pray that we always recognize just how precious uh, your words are, and that we're thankful uh, that you give them to us, and we take them seriously when we study them, and um, pray that we just help each other tonight, and we try to find uh, what, what you're trying to teach us, Truth and that we can learn from uh, Israel's past and uh, that we can try to live as you want us to live and um, that we can have a relationship with you that you want us to have with you. Uh, so just be with us tonight, that you give us wisdom. Uh, so we just be praying this morning. Amen. All right. Um, we're looking at Judges chapters 9 through 12 tonight. And um, I want you to look at the last little paragraph of chapter 8 before we get into those. Of course, the previous judge is Gideon. And Gideon um, delivered them from the Midianites. They wanted to make him king. He refused. He said, the Lord your God shall be your king. Gideon was uh, an incredibly good man. He was a good judge. Um, some people might fault him. He, he took the part of the plunder from destroying the Midianites, the earrings. He made an ephod and became a snare to the house of Gideon. I don't know if that means they ended up worshiping it or, or what. But um, when we look at his death and we look at what happened immediately after that, it says in verse 33, And it was so, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Berith their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeru Baal, that is Gideon, in accordance with the good that he had done for Israel. So God here is acknowledging the good that Gideon had done for Israel and how he had saved them from the oppression of the Midianites. In fact, when Gideon was judged, there was peace in Israel for 40 years okay, under his leadership. But when we look at these verses, I mean, think about this. What kind of people do these verses describe? Wishy washy. Wishy washy? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a pretty good. He's got a good leader, and he's going to follow him. Off the platform or whatever, then back up. Yeah, wishy-washy pretty much describes Israel throughout the entire book of Judges. Right. You know, back and forth, back and forth. But uh, what really impressed me was verse 33. When did they forsake God? When did they turn back to their sinful ways? It says, as soon as he died. And it's like you almost get the impression these people are sitting there just waiting for him to die. So they can go back to their sin with their false gods. And um, it, it just kind of amazes me because God had raised him up. Gideon had pointed them in the direction of God. Everything's going great. As soon as he dies, bam, you know, everything falls apart. Um, then in verse 34, of course, what does it say about these people? Yeah, they didn't remember the Lord. Okay. It says right there, the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with these people? Do they have some kind of mental disability that is, is just no short-term memory, I guess, or no long-term memory? And then, of course, in verse 35, what's the third thing that is used to describe these people? No. No, here's Gideon, and he had saved them from the Midianites through the hand of God, clearly, and refused to be their king, and he's a, a great leader for them. There's peace for 40 years, but as soon as he dies, they don't show any kindness or respect to his family at all. It's like, Gideon, big deal. Um, this is how enamored they are of these foreign gods. So that brings us now to the sons of Gideon. How many sons did he have? 71. 70, possibly 71, possibly 72, right? I think he had 71. His 70 sons, 
and then there is Abimelech. Okay, what was unique about Abimelech of his sons? What was unique about Abimelech in regard to all of his other sons? Yeah, he was the son of a prostitute. Okay, he was the son of Gideon's concubine. Later, he's referred to; she's referred to as his slave girl. Um, so he is not the son of his legitimate wife, if you will. And we're going to come up against this again in regards to Jephthah, who is going to be a judge here down the line. And so here's Abimelech, and um, where's he from? He's from Shechem. Okay. We look at verses 1 through 4. It says, Abimelech, the son of Jerubel, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. Which is better for you, that all 70 of the sons of Jerubel reign over you, or that one reign over you? Remember that I am your own flesh and bone. And his mother's brothers spoke all these words concerning him in the hearing of all the men of Shechem. And their heart was inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. So they gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Barith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men, and they followed him. Okay? So here's Shechem. And that is, anybody tell me anything about Shechem? At all, we read about it fairly often in the in the scriptures. It's a Levitical city. What? Levitical city. Okay, it's a Levitical city of refuge. Okay, we know that um, the city of refuge, refuge, it was given to the Kohathites. Okay, at this time, it also seemed to be a center of Canaanite worship. Right. Notice here in verse four says, so the men of Shechem gave him 70 shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless men. Okay? Baal Berith means Lord of the Covenant. Okay? And so this is their idol. This is their temple. And uh, it's going to come into play here in a little bit as well. But um, Lord of the Covenant. And when we think about Lord of the Covenant, there's a reason that they might have a temple to Baal Barith. Take a look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, or chapter 12 here, God establishes his covenant with Abraham. And this is the first instance of it. It says in verses 6 and 7, So Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah. That terebinth tree is going to come up again. As far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay. So think about how important Shechem is going to be in the Jewish eyes, right? In the eyes of the Jewish people. It is a city that is going to have some significance. In fact, if you look at Genesis 35 at verse 4, we read about Shechem again, but this time in relationship to Jacob. Does anybody remember that story? What happens in Genesis chapter 34? Jacob had 12 sons, but he also had a daughter, right? Dinah. Dinah, right? And Shechem, the son of Hamor, after whom the city is most likely named, right? Or actually, um, he may have been named after the city, you know, place name. Um, he takes Dinah and he violates her and uh, wants to marry her. And so they agree to do that if the men of Shechem will do what? Circumcised. Be circumcised, right? And so on the third day after they're circumcised, what happens? Simeon and Levi go in and kill every single male among them. 
right? every single one. And of course, uh, Jacob said to them in verse 30 of chapter 34, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Okay. Then um, Jacob's getting ready to leave that area, and look at what happens in verse 4. Jacob has told his household to put away their foreign gods. And verse 4 says, So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which is by Shechem. Right? So there's a terebinth tree again. This tree is going to take kind of a special place in uh, Jewish culture as well. <laughs> then when we look at Joshua chapter 24, and this isn't the first time in Joshua, but this is the one we're going to look at. In verse 1, Joshua is renewing the covenant with them at Shechem. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Then we drop down to verses 25 through 26. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So at some point, the tabernacle was at Shechem as well. And so Abraham has erected an altar. Joshua has erected a monument as well. Then take a look at 1 Kings chapter 12. In 1 Kings chapter 12 at verse 1, after the death of Solomon, Rehoboam is going to become the king over the southern kingdom, actually over all Israel, till they rebel. And it says, Now Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Right? So apparently it was a place that they regarded uh, with great reverence. This is where they made kings. This is what's going to happen in the book of Judges to um, Abimelech. The men of Shechem are going to make him a king. Um, look at verse 6 of Judges chapter 9. It says, And all the men of Shechem gathered together all of Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king beside the terebinth tree at the pillar that was in Shechem. Right? So you get the idea that this terebinth tree is also called an oak tree. Pretty long-lived tree. And um, they talk about the pillar that was in Shechem. This may have been erected by Abraham. It may have been erected by Joshua. But when you take into account the covenants that were made in Shechem, it's not unusual for them to name Baal Berith, their temple, Lord of the Covenant, because that's what was known to take place there. So Shechem seems to be somewhat of a, of a sacred place to the Jews at this time. And um, Abimelech here is from Shechem. They try to make him a king at Shechem. Back up to verse 5. What did Abimelech do to his brothers? Killed them, right? When we read verse 5, it says, Then he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the seventy sons of Jerubbaal, on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbaal, was left because he hid himself. All right. What's implied by the idea of kill them all on one stone? He's hired 70 worthless, reckless men with the money from the temple of his God, I would imagine. And he uh, has taken them and he's used them. It's not like they waged a warfare. It's not like there was a battle. It says he killed them all on one stone. What does that imply? One after the other, he executed them. You know, it's like you line up 70, 69 in this case, 69 of them, and just stab them or off with their heads. That's exactly how he did it. But the idea of on one stone means that 
he most likely just executed them. Okay. He said he killed seven sons of his brothers, but there was one left. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then that might be seventy-two sons. I know, that's why I said seventy-two earlier. Right? So I would imagine earlier it says that that Gideon had seventy sons. So it's just like okay, he took the seventy sons, but one escaped, which would mean sixty-nine. So I, I don't know. All right, but the one that escapes is the youngest because he hid himself, and his name is Jotham. Okay, and Jotham um, gives a parable in verses seven to twenty-one. Uh, what's the gist of this parable? It's one of the significant ones of the Old Testament. It's actually a pretty beautiful parable. He says to the trees, he, he stands up on Mount Gerizim, he lifted his voice and cried out and said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees went once forth to anoint a king over them. And so they go to the olive tree, and the olive tree refuses. Then they go to the fig tree, and the fig tree refuses. Then they go to the vine, and the vine refuses. And who do they eventually find? The bramble, right? A, a weedy, thorny bush. Okay? They find a bramble. And look at verses 14 and 15. Then all the trees said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Who's this bramble in the parable? It's Abimelech. Okay. And so what is Jonathan saying in this parable about Abimelech in comparison to others? He's worthless. He's, he's a worthless man. He's a worthless man. He's just nothing but a weed, basically. And he's already demonstrated that. It's not because his mother was a prostitute. He has no choice in that matter. You know, that has nothing to do with Abimelech. Abimelech shows his character in his desire for kingship, his murder of all of his brothers, and he himself is just not a, a savory character, right? And so he's the bramble. Now notice what the bramble says, right? This is, this is almost a hostage situation, verse 15. The bramble said to the trees, if in truth you anoint me as king over you, then come and take shelter in my shade. What shade can a bramble offer? Not a whole lot at all, right? In fact, um, some of the commentators will comment on this idea of a bramble as a very low growing weed, right? It's not going to cast much shadow at all or provide much shade at all. It says, then come and take shelter in my shade. And prickly. Yeah, yeah, and, and prickly, right? And he certainly was. Yeah. Okay. He says, but if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. That's a threat. You know, and Abimelech is saying, hey, if you're not going to let me be your king, then you're going to be destroyed, right? If, if you're false about this, then you will end up being destroyed. And that's exactly what happens. And we're going to see how the history plays out, and this parable actually comes about. In fact, in relationship to the parable, listen to what Jotham says in verse 16. Now, therefore, if you have acted in truth and sincerity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbaal and his house and have done to him as he deserves, for my father fought for you, risked his life and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. But you have risen up against my father's house this day and killed his 70 sons on one stone and made Abimelech the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem because he is your brother. If then you have acted in truth and sincerity with Jerubbaal and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you. All right. So here's Jotham. He's saying, look, if, if this is good, if this is all, you know, fine, then great. Okay. You, would, you rejoice in one another. But then listen to what he says in verse 20. But if not, let fire come from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. 
and let fire come from the men of Shechem and from Beth Mill and devour Abimelech. Jotham ran away and fled. He went to Beer and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Okay. So now, the rest of chapter 9 is going to talk about the fulfillment of that parable. It's going to talk about the fall of Abimelech. Okay. Um, so here's Abimelech. Look at verse 22. It says, After Abimelech had reigned over Israel three years, Okay, so God's going to allow him to uh, strut his stuff for about three years. And I think we mentioned last week that most likely he did not reign over all of Israel. Shechem is kind of between Manasseh and Ephraim. These are the descendants of Joseph. And uh, most likely his reign nominally extended to maybe those two tribes. And that was probably about it. Nobody saw him as a king over all Israel. So, in verse 23, who takes charge? God does. God does. God does. It says in verse 23, God sent a spirit of ill will between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Jerubel might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them and on the men of Shechem who aided him in the killing of his brothers. So, um, we look at this, and uh, what lessons can we learn here? I mean, we know how this is going to go. They're going to end up killing and destroying one another. But what lessons can we learn here from Abimelech? God was in charge the whole time. Okay. And we would think, why didn't he do it right then? That he allowed him to live like this. Okay, God's in charge. He's always in charge. Abimelech wants to take matters into his own hands. Do we sometimes do that in our lives? You know, we, we want to take matters into our own hands. We, also, we often do this in difficult times, in trying times. Um, we're, we're in a situation that is difficult, it's trying, um, it's a trial. And we start scratching and clawing to get out of it as quick as we can. Okay. Randy. I think there's a um, conflict I've had in the past because there's situations you feel you're in and you're questioning what yourself and what God wanted me to do this. Is this how God expects me to get out of it? Or am I somehow taking it and whittling on God with these things? You never know. How yeah. are you supposed to differentiate one from the other? Okay, this is a good question. We we get in a fix. And it's like, okay, how are we going to get out of this? The scriptures tell us over and over again, you know, to wait on the Lord, right? But also, it tells us that if we sit on our hands and do nothing, we're not going to be able to expect much in return. So, you know, when do we, Randy's asking, when do we, you know, put forth our best effort? Or when do we step back and say, okay, what does God want me to learn here? When do I feel like I'm whittling on God's end of the stick? You know, how do I, how do I deal with this? Okay. So what's the first thing that we ought to do in order to know how to deal with that? Pray. pray, absolutely, right? We should pray. And what should we pray for first and foremost? Wisdom. Wisdom, okay, that might be tied with another one. Yes. Thy will, right? <laughs> Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, right? And um, I think many of you have been in a situation where should I do this or should I do this? And you just don't know. I mean, you just don't know. And uh, in situations like that, I would just say, Lord, I'm going to pursue this course of action, but let your will be done, right? If it's not right, defeat me. I got no problem with that because I know that God ultimately cares about me. If he's going to leave me in a situation where I'm being tried and tempted for a while, you know what? Maybe he's trying to teach me something. Maybe he wants me to grow spiritually. Um, one, of the, one of the problems we run into is when we start trying to get out of a bad situation, we kind of leave God behind. You know, we set him off to the side. 
and we try to take matters into our own hands and we start um, thinking in ways that aren't conscious of God and we start thinking about, okay, what do I do here? What do I do here? And God is left back there. And what we need to do is we need to keep God close. We need to draw near to him so that he'll draw near to us at all times in those difficult situations. And so, you know, you got the idea. God's in control, right? Never forget that. And, um, you know, you've just got to sometimes step back, take a breath, think about, okay. First off, what would God want me to do here? And if either one's okay, it's like, choose one and pray, right? Florian and Brandy. Um, first Peter, like you think of First Peter 5, 4, 1, 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your care on him because he cares for you. It starts off with humility though. Uh -huh. Like understanding that I can't control every situation that I've got. So yeah. I humble myself enough to know that God cares. I'm going to have to give it. Sometimes you just have to give it to God. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Randy? But it also says that God uses us in such a way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that's where the conflict comes from. How do I know I'm not being used in that way? Yeah. Because I was put here for this purpose at this time. Yeah. To interact with some people or whatever. Right. So. That's, that's where you just got to pray, trust, and <laughs> ask for his guidance, you know? Um, you know, how many of you, how many of you have gone through a really trying experience only to later in life be able to draw from that experience to help somebody else? How many of you have, have that happened to? You know, it's like God can train us and he can prepare us. You know, and this is what James chapter one is talking about when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Right? Knowing the trying of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, its complete work, that you may be perfect or complete, lacking in nothing. Right? And so, what help are any of us going to be if we ourselves have never faced adversity? If you have never faced adversity, you're not going to be able to help anybody. Kim? You're also never going to know what you need, God. Yeah. God puts us through adversity at times, or not, I should say, allows us to have the adversity in our life so that we know we need Him. Yeah. We cannot make it without Him. Yeah. And that's certainly one of the overall stories and themes of the book of Judges. It's like, you guys leave me, look what happens. Right? You guys come back to me, look what happens. Yeah. And so it teaches us some very important things. Um, another lesson we can learn from Abimelech is uh, as a man sows. So shall he read. I mean, look how this guy got his start. Well, let's start off by murdering 70 of my brothers. Okay? How do you think that's going to end up? How does any rational person think that's going to end up? Okay? And then, of course, another lesson we can learn is that even if it's three years later, Janet was saying, hey, God's in control. He let him move along for three years. But ultimately, God avenges the innocent. And that's what this is all about. In fact, it says it right there, verse 24, that the crime done to the 70 sons of Jerubel might be settled and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who aided him in the killing of, excuse me, of his brothers. So God eventually puts everything right. I mean, think, think about Think about what we're moving towards, called the Day of Judgment, okay? Is that not the time at which everything is going to be put right? Everything will be right. Everything will be as it should be. And that's one of the great things that's going to be in heaven, right? Everything will be right. No tears in heaven. And that's going to be a wonderful thing. You know, we go through life and we may suffer some injustice, we may suffer some abuse or cruelty, um, those that we love or care about, or we may see all the injustice and the cruelty that exists in the world, and it frustrates us, it can get to us. But rest assured, it all will be put right. You know, God is a just judge. He's merciful, but he's just. 
And that's something I think that we always need to, to think about. So um, you have this little soap opera that goes on between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. He ends up burning, literally fire goes out from Abimelech. If you take a look at verse 47 of chapter nine, it says it was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. Then Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him, and Abimelech took an ax in his hand and cut down a bough from the trees and took it and laid it on his shoulder. And then he said to the people who were with him, what you have seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. So each of the people likewise cut down his own bound followed Abimelech, put them against the stronghold and set the stronghold on fire above them so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died, about a thousand men and women. And this is after they've had a few battles, right? So quite literally, fire went out from the bramble and destroyed the men of Shechem, okay? Then what's the end of Abimelech? After he leaves Shechem, he goes up to Thebes and he besieges the city. And what happens to him? It was a woman. Yeah, a woman, right? And uh, this is a very, uh, it, what's the word, ignominious death for Abimelech. Um, it says in verse 53, a certain woman dropped an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me, lest men say of me a woman killed him. So his young man thrust him through and he died. Then in verses 56 and 57, thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father by killing his 70 brothers. And all the evil of the men of Shechem, God returned on their own heads. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubel. Okay. Um, it says he ruled as a king. Do we count Abimelech as one of the judges? I'm not so sure that we do. This guy was kind of outside the whole order of things. He's kind of an upstart. Money? Well, I mean, the period of the judges, typically it says they turned to God and and then God delivered them. That wasn't said in this case at all. Yeah, that's not the case with the Bimelech at all. You don't read that at all. Okay, anybody got any questions or comments about chapter 9 here before we move on? All right, then we're going to move on to chapter 10. And chapter 10, um, we have some pretty amazing developments here. We have two judges spoken of in the first five verses. And that's Tola um, and Jer. Uh, in verse one, I thought this was interesting. After Abimelech there arose to save Israel, Tola the son of Pua. Okay? And then in verse three, and after him rose Jer, a Gileadite, and he judged Israel 22 years. So we've got basically Gideon for 40 years, Abimelech for three, Tola for 23, Jer for 22. So we've got about a total of 88 years of relative peace. Now I realize that, you know, with the Bimelech, you got stuff going on, but you don't have a record of the Midianites oppressing them. You don't have a record of the Philistines oppressing them. You've just got these judges and they're judging, okay? But that's going to change. In verse six, and the children of Israel again did evil on the side of the Lord and served the Baals, the Asherahs, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. What is significant about verse six? Up to this point, it says that when they forgot the Lord, they served the Baal and the Asherah. Who are they serving now? every God that they can lay their hands on. I mean, they're, they're just, it, it's reached a point where they're just going bonkers spiritually. And my question is, is what is so attractive about these false gods? You know, you've got Jehovah, you've got the God of Israel who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, and every step of the way, he has heard their prayers, he has delivered them, he has fed them, he has clothed them, he has given houses they didn't build, vineyards they didn't plant, wells they didn't dig. He has taken care of them. And after all that, it's like hardly any time can pass where they want to just jump ship 
and go over to this God or that God or this God or that God. What is so incredibly attractive about these gods? They're intermarrying with the... Okay, so basically, these gods made them feel good about themselves doing what they wanted to do in the first place. Okay? What, what are you going to say, Steve? They're being influenced by the, the nations around them that they're intermarrying with. Okay, they're certainly being influenced by the nations that they hadn't driven out. We know that they're intermarrying with them. The first part of the book of Judges tells us that. So there's a lot of that going on. But I go back to what Brandy's talking about. You know, here's, here's this rock that I've set up and called the God, right? Is that rock going to tell me how to live my life? No. No. I get to tell the rock. I get to tell my God how I want to live my life. And I can feel justified living that life. Does the same thing go on today? Does the same thing happen today? Yeah. But today, it's got this thin veneer of godly religion, okay? We have all these different man-made religions. We have all these different denominations out there. And all you got to do is you know, figure out what it is that you want to do, what you want to believe, what you want to practice, and take your pick. It's like, I think I like that one, right? Because I can do this, and I can be this, and I can think this way. And the person says, well, I kind of like this one over here. Right? And it's 31 flavors of religion. They haven't got 31 flavors out here, do they? What a shame. Right? 31 flavors in the West is ice cream. Right? Here they got Brahms, which is a very poor substitute. But uh, you know, you know, the idea of 31 flavors is <laughs> like people, they look at religion that way. It's like, oh, I can I, I like the chocolate fudge, right? Oh, I, I like the banana nut, you know? Oh, I like the strawberry shortcake, whatever. They just find what's attractive to them. And that's what pulls them to these other gods. Can we tell God how we want to worship? God's a little bit demanding compared to these other gods, isn't he? Right? God tells us how to live our life. God tells us that certain behaviors that are attractive to us are wrong and we shouldn't practice them. And then God instructs us in things that we ought to do that we oftentimes don't feel like doing, such as love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? And so God holds us accountable. The rock does not. Cindy? It seems like there isn't, isn't the, the ones that they seem to be really going towards sex and killing their children. I don't understand why killing their children seems to be the one that they... Yeah. Why is that attractive? Right. Huh? Offering their children on, a, on an altar, it, it just, I, I just don't get it. Yeah. Okay. Let's deal with the first one. That's easy to comprehend. A lot of these gods and goddesses were fertility gods and goddesses, and so the worship of them involved sexual practices, which people could call religion. Okay. What would be attractive about serving a God who demanded that you sacrifice your child? Why would, why would that be attractive to anybody? We sit here and think, I can't think of a single reason that'd be attractive, right? What about religious zealots? Money, or we can Yeah, say? that's what I was going to say. I mean, that the idea of giving it all, yeah. there, there is a psychological appeal, I guess, to that, of mm -hmm. being, you know, radical and feeling, yeah. probably feeling good about yourself, that you're willing to do something so significant. I am so devoted to my God. I am so dedicated to God. It's almost like being a martyr, right? But you're not the one that has to die. Take a look at Micah chapter 6. This is a passage we noticed not too long ago on a Sunday morning. It's right after Jonah in your Old Testament. And in Micah chapter 6 at verse 6, Micah is contemplating how he can approach God. And he says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? 
Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? See the progression that he's making there? Yeah, and then he finally ends up how about sacrificing my child? It's like, this is like the ultimate thing. And um, you have probably at some point in your life or some point now, you know, know someone with the mentality that they are just so intent on being spiritually minded that there's nothing that they wouldn't do. In fact, I was listening to something talk about that for a while. I can't remember where it was. But the idea of child sacrifice, you also have to remember that, you know, as Cindy pointed out, a lot of these gods require the Shemosh, Molech, and what have you. Um, this was part of their culture, right? I mean, this has been a part of religious culture for many, many societies. You know, look at the Aztecs and the Incas, right, and the sacrifices. I mean, by the hundreds, they would sacrifice people. Um, even the Egyptians supposedly sacrificed people and they buried pharaohs and what have you. Um, you have people around them and they're sacrificing their children. They think that's powerful, right? There's nothing more powerful than that. I'm going to have the petitions that I've asked because I've given my child. When God had Abraham, thought he was going to sacrifice his child. Mm -hmm. And he admitted to do that because he trusted God. Right. And that God knew because of his commitment, I mean, that's a big commitment. Right. So obviously, that is probably the ultimate commitment and as far as that goes. You would be willing to sacrifice your own child like he did. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, definitely. And so it's a, it's a really big thing, and these people are getting pulled into it, getting sucked into it. In fact, the next judge is who? Jephthah. And what's significant about Jephthah? Yeah. The, the vow he made, right? And uh, we'll talk about that in detail when we actually get to it. So here's, um, here's Israel. They're going into sin again. And um, God says, says, verse 7, The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. And from that year they harassed and oppressed children of Israel for 18 years. Okay? So that they were, Israel was severely distressed, it says at the end of verse 9. Now, in verses 10 through 16, um, let's read it, and I've got some questions about it. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, because we have both forsaken our God and served the Baals. So the Lord said to the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, and from the people of Ammon, and from the Philistines, also the Zidonians, the Amalekites, and Mo Maonites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hand? Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. Then the children of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems best to you. Only deliver us this day, we pray. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. All right. What lessons can we learn from this passage? Did you just ring a bell? How incredibly rude. <laughs> All right, what lessons can we learn from this passage? 10 through 16. God is merciful. Okay, God's merciful. We'll get to that. He's forgiving. Okay. But the first one, who is their deliverer? God. God. And he tells them, look, didn't I deliver you from this and, this and 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 this? And you know what? I'm not going to do it anymore. So what's he telling them to do? Yeah, go to your gods, right, and see what happens. Okay? Go pray to your rock or your carved tree and see what happens. You know, you're putting your trust in them. Go cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you in your time of distress. Now, 
What does Israel think about that? What does Israel inherently know when God calls him to do that? It's not going to work. It's not going to work. This, this isn't going to work. Right? They know. They know that that's not a God. They know that's just a rock. They know that's just a gilded tree. So that's why they keep crying out to God. They know that these things can't help them. Why do they keep going back to them and worshiping them? It's like an addiction. It's like religion without consequence. Religion on my terms. Uh, the ability to practice a spirituality. Why did they bother with these gods at all? Why, why, you know, okay, turn away from God and just, why carve a rock? Why carve a tree? Why don't you just go off and do your thing? Why do they keep going to these other gods? They, they, they want to be like everyone else. Okay, they, maybe they want to be like everybody else. They, they, wanted to, they wanted a king and okay. they had a king. Right. Monty, what were you going to say? Well, I think there's an innate nature of uh -huh. man to, to want to know of a creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When God created us, how did he create us? Spirit beings, right? In his image. We have his spirit. We're spiritual beings. We can't deny it. People try to deny it, but when it comes right down to it, the old man told me this. And, you know, not that he's necessarily right, but he said, I asked him, old man, you believe in God? He says, Craig, everybody believes in God. And I kind of think that's true. Even the most hard-boiled atheists, when it comes right down to it, the, the moment of their death, I bet you they're thinking about God. Craig? Yeah? Kind of the same thing. They felt the need to worship, but mm -hmm. their worship was misplaced. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that happens to us all the time, you know, in this world and throughout life. You know, we, we misplace our trust and our worship. Okay, so who's been your deliverer? He says, I will deliver you no more. What do we learn from that? When God says, I'm, I'm done. God has a limit. God has limits. You can come to an end with God. Did that happen here? No, right? It says right there in verse 17, well, verse 16, his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Okay, so... Since that's the case, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'll pray to God at the end, and he'll be upset with me, and he'll be angry, but essentially, eventually, he's going to roll in, and he's going to have mercy on me, and everything will be all right. Anybody here want to take that chance? No. <laughs> Anybody here want to say, hey, yeah, you know, I'll bet all my eternity on that. Okay? But God says over and over again what's going to happen to those <laughs> who have served God and those who have served the world. I told you about uh, Jim, oh, what was his last name? He was a guy over here at, uh, at uh, Brookstone. And we talked, we talked, we talked. And this guy was one of the more lucid uh, members in the Bible study group, we talked. And I actually went over there and talked to him in person a couple of times, just went to his room. And uh, he knew he was dying, he knew he had a short time, he was having heart failure. I said, Jim, have you been listening to what we've been studying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you know, every time we do, you seem to kind of just shut down. He said, yeah, I said, you, you don't agree with, with what you're reading in the Bible, do you? He says, well, not your take on it. And I said, but Jim, you can see what it says. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I said, well, don't you think you need to do something about it? I mean, aren't you getting a little nervous? I said, Come on. And he says, well, that's just a, a chance I'm going to have to take. Blew my mind, right? Here's a guy. He's on death's doorstep. He's got the word of God in front of him. Doesn't agree with what it says. He says, that's just a chance I'm going to have to take. Give me a die and let me throw it for my salvation. Right? And it's, it's a loaded die and it's not in his favor. All right. All right. We'll pick up in chapter uh, chapter eleven and twelve next week. Okay.
you want to, you can take out a song book. We'll be doing number eight, five, Our God is Alive. We'll be singing the first and fourth verse with chorus of them. Sing loud, because I'm really nervous. I'm just going to start you guys keep going. All right. There is Uh, just a few announcements, but Craig wanted me to announce that the James workbooks are here, if you'll pick those up. I uh, want to welcome our visitors here tonight. We do have some with us, and uh, you're always welcome here at OWIRE. Appreciate y'all being here. Uh, I'm going to make these announcements, and then at the end we'll have our closing prayer, and then the elders have some information that we need to pass on to you. Uh, Austin is in Russellville. I was informed that Tara's grandmother is passing away as we speak. Catherine sits her, so Tara is over there. Lance is working. Ken is at home, not feeling well. And of course, remember our shut-ins. Uh, Dee will be back tomorrow. And if you haven't heard, Kale was baptized Monday night here at about 10 o'clock at night. So congrats to the Bray family and uh, certainly to Kale. And I know that we can all, uh, it, we'll be able, willing to encourage uh, Kale as he begins his walk as a young Christian. Uh, there appears to be dishes out by the mailboxes that need to be picked up. And of course, we'll meet again Sunday morning at nine o'clock. And we'll have a, our closing prayer now, and then have a few more announcements for you. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings you give us, God. Thank you for bringing us here this evening to learn more about you, God. Help, it to, um, help us all to have learned something. Help us to be edifying to each other as a congregation and to be lights as we go out into the world. Help give us wisdom in all of our decisions and that everything we do points back to you. We thank you for Kale God and just his baptism and help us all to be encouragements to him as he goes through this walk in life. We thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins so that one day we can have the hope of being in heaven with you, Lord. Help us all to reach that goal and to stay focused on that. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. I wrote some of this down, folks. Uh, my memory isn't what it once was, so I'm just going to read some of this. Uh, but Craig and the elders met Sunday after worship, and as we all know, Craig and his family have been taking care 